very privileged today to be talking in the library of Sir William Osler's house. Sir William Osler was one of the most famous professors of medicine ever. And we're talking to David Cranston, who is himself also a very eminent professor of medicine specializing in neurology and the kidney. Now, both of us, David, can go back about 50 years in terms of uh, how medicine was. We can't quite go back a hundred years, which would be to go back to Osler's time, but you're writing um, a biography of Osler, which is to come out fairly soon. But I'd like to put a question to you that I think he would probably also put to us, which is this. The big change that's occurred in those years, the hundred years, the fifty years, is one that perhaps contains the threat of dehumanizing medicine, that the amount of time that doctors can spend seeing a patient, the pressures that come from an aging population, which itself is a great triumph of medicine, <laughs> uh, that we're all living much longer. I'd like to ask what you think about all of that. And, What's the way forward? Well, I certainly agree with that. And uh, <clears throat> one of uh, Osler's great uh, 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 assets was his, the way in which he related to his patients and the people. Um, the, his students loved him and uh, his trainees loved him. But they also said that if you want to see the chief, as they called him, at his best watch him as he goes past the bed of some elderly person or some ill person and you'll always see how uh, compassionate and kind he was. And I think that when I started medicine, which was 40 years ago, uh, uh, there was obviously a lot more technology than there was when Osler was around, but a lot less than there is today. I specialise in kidney cancer and in that field, uh, you uh, diagnose people still by talking to them, by examining them, by the symptoms that they presented. And then you'd uh, confirm that diagnosis by the appropriate investigations. Nowadays, most patients with kidney cancer come to me with a diagnosis that's been made because of the ultrasounds, the CT scans that they've had for other reasons. And many of these things are picked up incidentally. And I think there is a great danger about looking at the results, about deciding what you're going to do, and forgetting that actually there's a person at the end of this. And uh, I find it, uh, I, I try and teach the students who still come to me to talk to the person. And Osler's great quote was, it's more important to think about the patient who has the disease than the disease that has the patient. And I think we are in the danger of losing that and we need to uh, make sure and try and ensure that our junior staff and indeed our colleagues don't forget that. And it's quite interesting because as a urological surgeon, I quite often see doctors who themselves have got uh, urological problems and then you see them on the other side and some cope extremely well with it and some cope extremely badly with it. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't lose the human side of medicine. And am I right, David, that this is more than just respecting the patient, which one should do, obviously, anyway. It's what that itself tells you about the attitude of the patient to their situation, to their problem. And I take it that what you would agree with is that you have to take that into account in thinking about what the best treatment is. Am I correct? In that? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, we see that, I see that uh, on a week-by-week -week basis. And, uh, you know, you, you need to talk to the patient and see what they want to do about it. And it's quite interesting. For example, a reasonably simple example is that we still have 
uh, patients who will come to the final examinations. Maybe they've got a hernia or something like that, and they are very um, amenable to allowing students to examine them. And you say to the students, you know, here's somebody who's got a hernia, what are you going to do about it? And they say, uh, operate on it. And you say, well, no, what you do is you ask the patient what they want done. Have they got any pain? Do they actually want it done or not? So we need to keep remembering that the patient is a part of the, and the most important part of the process. We have these things called multidisciplinary team meetings where you have everybody around talking about, for example, a biopsy result and what you're going to do. And, you know, well, sensibly, of course, what you do is you say, we're going to talk to the patient about it in the meeting. But as I keep saying, you know, in these meetings, the most important person is not there, that is the patient. And you don't want everybody to say, oh, they need to have this done, they need to have that done. Well, maybe that is what they need to be done, but you need to talk to the patient first and see what they want done. So this sort of goes back to the old Hippocratic Oath, doesn't it? Don't do more harm. <laughs> Than good. Exactly. And exactly. if indeed, as you say, the patient is uh, him or herself perfectly clear, I can live with this, yes. provided I know what to do, um, you actually save yes. the expense exactly. and trouble of a major operation. Yes, absolutely. But this t- takes me to the, to the beginning of our discussion, David, which is the challenges facing health services around the world, because it's not just here in the United Kingdom, it's absolutely global, that as populations uh, become healthier for most of their life, but then prolonging life into the period when the diseases become very multifactorial, very complex. The treatment also can then be very difficult, very prolonged, and we face a difficulty, don't we? How can we afford the resources that are needed to deal with the problem that we've created by saving patients' lives? Yeah, uh, that is absolutely true, and um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, Sir Richard Doll, who lived in this house, who sat in this chair, who uh, made the link between lung cancer and smoking, uh, certainly said that, uh, implied that stopping people smoking isn't going to uh, save the NHS money, because people who smoke may die earlier of uh, lung cancer or vascular disease but then they live longer and uh, they'll have other things later on in life so that is true i think that although um, few doctors i think are in favor of euthanasia and i certainly am not in favor of euthanasia i think also uh, we need to be careful not to go the other way and unnecessarily strive to keep uh, very you know people who Uh, have come to the natural end of their life um, and are very happy to die, uh, you know, to to strive officiously to keep alive, Um, you know, treating perhaps people, you know, in their 90s who are are very ill and, you know, just want to have a quiet, peaceful death to try officiously to keep them alive. And therefore, again, you know, you need the discussion with the patient and the family. Um, but I think the whole problem is uh, is huge in terms of, you know, an increasing population, an increasing number of um, elderly people who will inevitably get all sorts of illnesses. And, you know, what is the answer to that? I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, making uh, things as mo- more, most efficient as they can. I think there is a lot of waste in the health service. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, unnecessary expense um, and in terms of all sorts of things like uh, government targets which sometimes are helpful and sometimes are very unhelpful. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are running around uh, micromanaging the situation but I think I, I, I don't have an easy answer to uh, the financial situation and problems. Just a final question for you, David. We've both taught medical students. You, as a clinical professor, me, as a preclinical tutor. An interesting uh, paradox that 
we select for some of the very brightest and most intelligent people on earth <laughs> because the competition to become medical students is so high we actually in the end rely on them being good doctors yep. and that's not the same thing as being highly intelligent is it no. so what would your advice to young people thinking of entering medicine today be what should they be looking for why should they come into medicine and what can they expect from it well i think i think that the young doctors are or, or students and people at school are always taught about things to say you know that you want to care for people and you want to look after people um, which is fine you know how do you test for that um, maybe uh, another issue as, as you say it's not the brightest and the best I think uh, persistence and so on I for example I actually failed my medical finals and had to do an extra six months um, I have a son who's not uh, a medic but he's a vet who failed to get into every veterinary school in the United Kingdom two years in succession and uh, most people would have said well give up and do something else but he persisted and eventually did it and I think I think what I would say to the young people is um, uh, a certain amount of intelligence obviously is important but be compassionate and caring and above all uh, be persistent if that's what you want to do and you really want to do it then don't give up and be persistent. Somebody said to me once which was a very interesting quote uh, don't try to be clever in Oxford everybody's clever be nice and the world is at your feet and I think there's a certain amount of truth in that but certainly in terms of medicine uh, you need a certain amount of cleverness but I think you need a lot of persistence as well. Well thank you for that advice to young people and thank you for also for your thoughts on medicine today. We're really honoured to be able to speak to you and particularly in the chairs occupied by Sir William Osler and in his magnificent library. Thank you very much. A great pleasure.